Greetings and welcome to another C Sharp live coding session. Last time around we were working on a Minecraft server launcher and we actually managed to get it to launch a server, hook some events so we can monitor the progress of server loading, uh, server shutting down and so on and so forth. Um, However, it would be nice if we could also uh, remotely control uh, what the server does. So for that uh, we are going to use the Archon protocol. Um, Archon is a remote console uh, service that a Minecraft server um, supports. Um, it's basically taken directly from um, Valve's uh, source remote console. Um, but uh, before we look into that, um, I would like to quickly outline what a network protocol is. Uh, in any kind of com uh, computer network communication, um, the server and the client share a common language. Um, this is typically some kind of um, tightly packed um, data being sent back and forth um, and the protocol outlines exactly what that data is meaning when a client sends a request to the server the server needs to know what that request looks like so it can recognize it and um, equally uh, when the server responds to the client's request um, the server uh, transmits the data in a certain format uh, that the client can recognize as an actual response from the server. Um, that basically outlines what a protocol is. For uh, Minecraft, um, uh, when using the uh, remote console uh, protocol, uh, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one copy of uh, Valve's original source remote con uh, console. And it's possible to find some protocol information. Um, this particular wiki uh, contains a lot of technical information about how Minecraft works and how uh, network protocols uh, work, uh, including all the authentication and user accounts and blah blah blah. Uh, you can find most of it on this wiki. Um, I've uh, um, put the link to this page um, in uh, one of the panels on the Twitch page uh, in case you want to uh, study this closer. Um, so this basically outlines how um, um, a remote uh, console client should communicate with the server and what kind of responses uh, to expect. One thing I did find though is that um, this particular page is um, perhaps a little bit lacking in uh, detailed information. However, it does link to the original source Archon protocol descriptions which I have open here. Um, this in comparison contains a whole lot more information including some um, uh, binary examples of data being uh, passed between server and client. Um, there are also some uh, code samples on how to do it um, as well as links to God knows how many different implementations of um, this particular protocol. Uh, some are meant for uh, web-based um, handling and some are meant for application-based handling. Um, today we are going to write um, our own implementation of uh, the remote console uh, protocol and of course we are going to test it up against um, the local Minecraft server that I have running here. Um, okay, so <clears throat> first of all, um, 
when um, establishing a um, connection to the server, we uh, need to do that through a, a standard TCP IP uh, network connection. Um, TCP is a static connection, meaning once you establish it, uh, the connection stays there until you disconnect either from the server or from the client. Um, so, in those respects, uh, we effectively don't need to uh, do a whole lot in terms of uh, keeping the connection alive. Uh, that's part of the TCP IP protocol it's itself. Um, initially, when we connect to the server, uh, we need to transmit a packet um, uh, to the server. Um, this uh, section here, basic packet structure, outlines um, how uh, a particular packet should be uh, put together. Um, and um, effectively, um, these particular uh, ways of transmitting data um, are identical regardless which direction the packet is going, whether it's going from client to server or it's the server responding with uh, something back to the client. Uh, the packet is basically the same. Um, since we're not messing with the server itself, um, we know that it will uh, transmit um, a standard packet back, uh, but uh, depending on um, where um, in the process we are, uh, packets may um, return an empty body. Um, some commands uh, executed in the console uh, will um, respond in kind with some kind of message, others will not. Um, sometimes, um, uh, again depending on which version of the Minecraft server we are running, uh, whether it's modded or not, uh, certain um, core commands uh, in the server console uh, will have an actual text response uh, while others absolutely will not. In any case, uh, we need to um, implement something that can handle these particular packets. Uh, this basically describes um, exactly how they should look. When performing a login through Archon, um, the server expects us to go through an authentication process. That's um, what happens right after we connect to the server. Um, the server authentication is um, effectively uh, sending a specific packet type, um, as we can see here, uh, server auth. Um, typically the first packet sent by the client will be a server data auth packet. Uh, which is, can I authenticate? Um, and um, the server will then respond with um, some kind of response depending on the outcome of this authentication challenge. It's basically a login. Um, now, uh, one thing to note about uh, this particular uh, protocol is that um, the password uh, that's being sent as part of the login package um, is effectively sent in the clear, meaning um, it's plain text, so uh, anyone that uh, decides to go through a proxy or uh, if somebody has a uh, packet sniffer somewhere, um, that password can be um, siphoned off the network communication. And there are people out there doing this. so. In effect, uh, the password is sent over an insecure, unencrypted connection. Now, for our uh, specific purposes, uh, it doesn't matter all that much, uh, because I'm planning to put in a, um, a password randomizer uh, that basically generates a new password every time we uh, start up the server. Um, we could also implement uh, options to uh, effectively change um, the Archon port at every uh, server startup. 
um, just to make it a little more difficult to uh, actually connect to it uh, in case somebody des decides to sniff the packets. In any case, um, uh, if the um, password that we sent as part of the initial authentication uh, packet, packet uh, is correct, then um, the server will send some kind of response. And this is what we have right here. Server data auth response. This packet is a notification of the connection's current auth status. When the server receives an auth request, it will respond with an empty server data response value, followed immediately by a server data auth response indicating whether authentication succeeded or failed. Note that, is that the status code is returned in the packet ID field, so when pairing the response with the original auth request, you may need to look at the packet ID of the preceding server response value. Um, this effectively describes to us in technical terms um, how the uh, authentication handshaking should take place. Um, as listed here, if authentication was successful, the ID assigned by the request, if it fails, uh, the ID will always be negative one. Now, for um, the actual packet structure, uh, we need to go back here and have a quick look. Um, initially, um, we need to put in a size. Uh, that size um, includes the entire package uh, packet size. So anything from and including the ID to and including the last um, zero terminated um, string. So we definitely need to keep track of how much data we are going to send when we send a packet. Um, and we can also use this to uh, verify that um, we actually did get a correct length packet from the server. Now, as you can see, it says a 32-bit uh, little endian signed integer. Uh, any int uh, value um, is a 32-bit uh, value, um, since one byte can hold eight bits, a 32-bit value needs four bytes. Um, we can use some conversion tools to um, convert things back and forth. Um, now, one other thing that we need to uh, keep track of is uh, text encoding. Since we are basically sending um, text commands back and forth, um, we need to ensure that we encode this text in the right way. Um, over here, I believe, um, yes, right here, uh, packet format, uh, the length of the packet, which is identical to the size, uh, the request ID, uh, client generated ID, mm, we need to generate some kind of ID, um, the type of packet being sent, um, these are identical to uh, the source ones, and then payload. And right here it says it has to be a byte array. Um, anything sent over a network connection is typically sent as byte arrays, uh, so that's kind of just the way it is. However, right here it says it has to be ASCII encoded. Uh, so that basically means we cannot um, use uh, Unicode, we cannot use uh, UTF-8, or any of the other text encoding standards out there. It has to be ASCII. So that's one thing that we need to note. Um, next up, it describes 2-byte padding, um, 2 null bytes, uh, which is actually incorrect, because if you look at the original uh, description, it says it has to be a null terminated ASCII string. A null terminated ASCII string means um, it has to end with a character zero at the end of it. 
and following that another empty string again null terminated so uh, in effect uh, the payload listed here should end with a uh, byte of zero and following that um, effectively another empty uh, or sorry another payload but this time it should be empty and be terminated by a an zero byte okay uh, this is all pretty technical um, but this is this is um, how computers actually communicate. All right, um, let's have a quick look at our project. So, um, <coughs> for this we need to um, build uh, some code that can actually handle this um, Archon network protocol. Um, and for that, uh, we need to get into a little bit of socket programming. Now, luckily, it's um, fairly straightforward with uh, C Sharp, so um, we should probably think about where to put it. Um, up here, I will create another folder called networking. That then becomes the um, namespace for us and then we will add another class to it. Let's get rid of this quick and we will name this source remote console since it basically follows the uh, source um, valve source uh, protocol we might as well name it accordingly. Alright, now um, Doing any kind of networking uh, usually involves um, being able to um, send some kind of data to uh, the remote computer as well as being able to receive uh, data from the remote computer. Um, for uh, this particular setup, um, I would like to run all of the networking stuff again in a separate thread just like we did on the server host last time. Um, by doing that uh, we again avoid uh, the issues of um, uh, the current thread being blocked uh, in case for example uh, the server is not responding. Um, so um, this particular uh, class um, I will build up uh, to effectively become a standalone um, remote console class that we can instantiate and then through simple means connect to a remote ho host somewhere that supports uh, the valve source remote console protocol um, just to make it easier to use in the future. Uh, the reason uh, I want to build it up this way is um, to effectively create um, a nice class that we can include in a future project somewhere uh, should we want to. Okay, um, let's get some coding done here. We'll start by uh, throwing in a constructor for the class. Uh, we don't know yet uh, what kind of um, uh, details we might want to uh, set, so let's just e leave it empty for now. Okay, um, we know that we at least need to specify an IP address uh, for the remote host. We also need um, know that we need to specify which port to connect to. Um, anything in uh, networking um, effectively supports some 65,535 ports um, on every IP. Um, however, there are a bunch of port numbers that are reserved for uh, system services. Uh, all of this information is something that you can easily Google. Um, anyway, uh, we know that we need an IP for the remote host. We also need a port number. 
Um, and of course, we also need to um, have um, a password and uh, we need some kind of um, response coming back from um, rem the remote host. But to start with, let's get some um, variables down that can hold some of the information for us, um, and then we will take it from there. Okay, so first of all, um, we know that we need an IP address, uh, which is in the system.net namespace, um, remote IP. Um, just for the sake of argument, we will um, pre-generate this with a uh, local host um, reference and local host is always 127.0.0.1. There we go. We also know that um, we need a re to specify a remote port, so we'll do that. And um, as we can see here, uh, the uh, default... No, actually it doesn't show here. Uh, Oh, sorry, it does. The default port is 25575. So, uh, why don't we pre-initialize it to uh, the default port? We can always change it later. Uh, the default Minecraft server Archon port. There we go. Alright. Now at least we've uh, got some variables to take care of um, the remote IP as well as the remote port. Um, now we kind of need some um, implementation that allows us to change these. So I'm kind of figuring why not put these up in the um, method that uh, specifies we need to uh, connect to this remote host. So. Let's get some methods in here. Um, public methods. We'll do some code cleanup along the way. Um, I'm purposely uh, doing these in sort of randomized order uh, just to show you that uh, having a semi-chaotic way of building up the code along the way um, is something that's perfectly natural. Uh, don't be uh, discouraged if you feel that you're putting in your code uh, a little bit chaotic or randomly. Um, but there are some tools available to us to um, try and keep the code at least a little bit organized. Um, we know that we need a connect method, um, which of course will uh, attempt to connect to the remote host, so why not just name it connect. So let's get a connect method. Um, since we need to um, tell this um, remote uh, console um, network connection thingy um, where we want to connect to, um, we might as well uh, specify the arguments uh, for that particular process. So um, we will have a remote IP IP address. Uh, we also need to specify a remote port. Um, and since we need to authenticate by means of a simple password, uh, we might as well throw that into the mix now we're, uh, while we're at it. So. Um, let's call this out password. There we go. All right. Um, <coughs> just for the sake of uh, keeping things a little more, um, how should I put this um, down to earth? Let's just call this server port and server IP. We'll add in some help for ourselves um, 
attempt to establish a connection to a remote server. Uh, the IP address of the remote server to connect to and the port that the remote server is listening on. Uh, the uh, password to authenticate with. There we go. Uh, um, this, in case you don't know, um, becomes Intelli uh, IntelliSense tooltip help um, uh, when uh, written in. So if we, uh, just for the sake of it, go here and um, let's do a quick test method here. Testing. There we go. And then we will do source remote console, import the namespace, uh, archon equals new uh, source remote console. Then we can do archon.connect and as we can see right away, attempt to establish a connection to a remote server, which is exactly what we wrote. Um, once we get to this point, uh, it then adds um, in italic the IP address of the remote server to connect to, just like we wrote it. Um, it would be great if you could get into the habit of uh, adding these um, as you are creating the methods and properties and whatnot, um, because uh, if you just keep coding and forget about documenting um, the code that you write, then at some point, say six months down the line, when you get back to the code, you may have forgotten what it actually does, or how to use it, or what kind of arguments to, to pass to the method. So get into the habit of documenting uh, your code as you are writing it. It is the most valuable tool uh, in any kind of development. Okay, um, let's go through this. So here we know that we need to um, specify a, a server IP, a server port, and the authentication password. But we don't exactly have any means of storing the password. So let's put that up here quick. Um, we may need to rename these later on, but we'll see. Um, authentication password. And we will pre-initialize this empty. There we go. Okay. Um, before we get into actually um, storing um, the past values, um, we may want to check that um, at least some of it is uh, somewhat valid. Now, since we can actually change the um, listening port on the Minecraft server to effectively any port number we want, um, except for negative values, um, we may want to have a look at um, what uh, server port was specified. So let's make sure that the server port is greater than or equal to, uh, no, actually greater than 1024 uh, port numbers uh, from and including to and including uh, zero um, to uh, um, zero to uh, 1024 are by default uh, system reserved ports. Um, World Wide Web runs on port 80, um, SSL runs on port uh, 443, um, just to name a few, FTP runs on 20 and 21 and so on and so forth. 
So we need to make sure that it's at least greater than 1024 to avoid um, um, system reserved port conflicts. Um, we also need to know that, um, or need to check that the server port is, for example, less than uh, 65536, which is um, the highest number a word can contain. Uh, a word is a 16 uh, bit uh, integer, um, uh, unsigned, meaning it can go from 0 to 65, 536. So that's basically it. We also want to make sure that um, a password was actually specified, so let's trim this in case all spaces were put in there and then make sure that it's greater than it has a length greater than zero after trimming. Now if this is the case then um, store the past values our remote IP equals server IP the remote port equals the server port specified and the authentication password equals auth password and we'll do a trim uh, just in case somebody put in all spaces. Now the reason we definitely want to remove spaces here um, uh, meaning leading spaces and trailing spaces um, is to avoid uh, some kind of hiccup uh, with uh, the password specifications. As far as I know, um, the Minecraft server will internally do a trim on the Archon password itself, meaning even if you specify a bunch of passwords uh, in the server properties file, uh, those password, uh, sorry, those spaces will not translate into the actual password that it accepts um, coming from an Archon connection. So just to make sure that things are equal both ends, uh, we'll trim whatever spaces might be there. All right, next up down here to do uh, add in code to actually start connecting. This is something we will add later. All right, uh, we also know that uh, at some point we may want to uh, have our uh, client disconnect so we might as well add in a disconnect method. Um, public method, uh, disconnect. This can force our end to disconnect from the server. And public void, disconnect. We don't need to specify any kind of parameters because we don't really need to tell the server, hey, we're disconnecting now. We can just, boom, disconnect, done. All right, again, let's put up a wee bit of documentation. Um, disconnects from the remote server. Nothing much to it, but it's still a good idea to keep the, um, um, uh, keep putting in the documentation um, so we don't forget. Now, sometimes when I'm speed coding, um, I don't particularly care about uh, throwing in the documentation. Sometimes in my own projects um, I don't really care about putting in documentation because I don't expect others to ever see um, this particular code. Uh, it's just for my own internal use. Um, but having said that, um, I'm 45 now. Um, I'm an old school developer. Uh, yes, I did develop software on uh, the old DOS uh, operating system before we got graphical windows uh, and even back then um, I did do some documentation now and then um, but I wasn't particularly um, how should I put this steady at uh, adding in the documentation back then but those were the days. Um, today when software grows more and more complicated it just becomes more and more important to always make sure that you um, at least to some extent document what your code does at least to yourself. 
if you work in a team, then it's um, vitally important that you always make sure that you document whatever changes you make or whatever additions uh, you make or uh, document some kind of removal um, so the rest of the developers in your team can keep track of what you are doing on your part of the code. So keep that in mind. Anyway, um, again here we'll throw in a to-do. Uh, these um, effectively have no um, uh, say in how intelligent uh, intelligence works, but um, I do them this way because then I can just search for them and find all the places that I've put in some kind of to-do um, mention for myself. Add in code that signals uh, disconnection from whoops the remote host. Okay. Now the reason that I'm um, putting in these two to-dos is because I want to put the um, actual network handling into a, a standalone thread. The reason for doing this is to prevent blocking um, whatever thread um, instantiates uh, this class um, whenever network actions are taken. Um, there are two instances in network communication over a TCP IP connection where uh, the networking can actually end up blocking the thread it's running on. Uh, the first situation is um, during the attempt to connect to the remote host. Um, if you say uh, end up banging your hands against a firewall, um, the firewall will either um, accept the connection and instantly disconnect or it will simply not respond. Um, if the remote host is not responding then um, it effectively enters a timeout sequence where um, it waits for a certain amount of time before it then assumes that the remote host is not responding. Um, Sometimes we can configure this, sometimes we can't. Um, there are multiple different reasons why um, a timeout sequence um, executes, um, one of them being it's not responding. This could take, say, five seconds, uh, so that would effectively freeze um, the main UI for five seconds, not particularly fun. Um, and the other situation where uh, we could end up in a thread blocking um, is if um, the network connection is physically cut uh, between client and server while a data packet is being transmitted. Um, this can actually happen. Um, for example, um, some guy in an excavator somewhere uh, physically cuts a cable while digging a hole. Um, you're dog stumbles in your uh, router, um, your chinchilla chews the network cables, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's always uh, a good thing to um, at least avoid a situation where um, you could end up blocking yourself. So that's why we will put the um, network handling in a separate thread. <coughs> All right. Um, <coughs> Um, let's see, we have a connect, we have a disconnect. Um, we also need to, uh, at some point, add in some events uh, to handle um, what's actually going on with our network connection. Um, and it would also be beneficial if we could add in um, a property that we can check um, at any given time to see if we are actually still connected to the remote host. Uh, so let's add that in right now so we don't forget. Uh, properties. Um, you may have noticed that um, I always put the constructor at the bottom. Um, if I have uh, some kind of dispose um, implementation in here um, I put that underneath the constructor. Um, just above it I keep public methods and just above that I keep uh, pro publicly available properties. 
and at the very top um, whatever variables are uh, effectively gl um, global to this particular class uh, I keep at the very top unless it's a property of course. Anyway um, let's add in a uh, property called um, is connected and we will return a boolean there uh, connect it and it will only have a getter for now we will just force it to return false to do add code to check whether the TCP connection is viable okay um, and just to keep myself um, in the clear, um, I'll quickly check with my um, list of things to do today. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, we still need a um, some thread stuff. We need some uh, socket setup and so on and so forth. So let's put in a region up here to handle the um, socket thread stuff. There we go. Now we know that we need a thread so um, we'll add in a thread, import the namespace for it and um, let's just call this client thread set it to null. We also know that we need um, um, an actual method to uh, host it, um, but what else do we actually need for this? Now since we're going to run this in a separate thread, um, we effectively need to um, add in some kind of um, messaging or um, events that can trigger uh, depending on what the thread is doing. Um, we also need uh, some way of uh, uh, passing data from one thread to another so we can actually transmit the data, say for example um, do the authentication. Um, In terms of receiving a message from the server, uh, we can pretty much throw that into um, an event right away. But if we are attempting to send a message to uh, the server at the exact same time as we are receiving a message back from the server, then it could cause some problems. So to handle this, um, we will set up a queue uh, that handles um, accepting whatever needs to be sent and then we will do a queue processor. Uh, the queue processor will then um, grab one queued message at a time, send it to the remote host and then continue processing the queue until it's empty. Um, and for that we need a send queue. So just for the sake of um, keeping these things a little more organized, we will do um, send handling here and end region, and we will do uh, receive handling here. That way um, we can keep things separated uh, so it'll be a little easier to dig into um, those aspects of all this stuff. Okay, we know that we need a queue. Um, we also know that um, we need to transmit everything as a byte array uh, so we'll specify the data type as a byte array and then name this send queue. And we can uh, pre-initialize it to um, um, uh, an actual um, queue object right away. 
it's not something that we need to dig uh, too much into. Uh, the queue um, handles most of it for us. All right. Um, we should probably also do a section four or a region four um, events. So let's do that. And in the events section, um, we can put in um, a bunch of different events depending on uh, what exactly we want to report back to uh, the, the thread running this. Now, um, for the sake of um, keeping this uh, kind of fire and forget, um, we'll put in some um, events that um, effectively just tell us uh, what part of um, the process um, we're currently uh, working with. Um, we could potentially uh, have an event that tells us when we actively have connected to the remote host. Um, we could have one that takes care of informing us whether authentication was successful or a failure. Uh, we can have a disconnected event and so on. So uh, let's get some of those declared. Might as well do it. Okay, we need an event that tells us when we have successfully established a TCP connection to the remote host. Um, this could be useful for, say, um, changing UI settings. Um, whether we're going to use it or not, we'll see. We will do a connected event. There we go. And for that we need a public delegate. And we don't need any kind of response for it. Event handler. Um, we don't exactly need to um, specify any kind of per, uh, arguments or pass data back. We just need to know that we have successfully connected. Um, we'll tie in the event. And add a method that lets us raise the event. Um, there, invoke. Don't need to pass anything, so pretty straightforward. Triggers once a connection to the remote Post has been established. There we go. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum. We also could throw in a disconnected event, so we might as well do that. Uh, pretty much the same deal. Um, there we go. Event handler. Again, we don't really need to pass any kind of information. Um, add in the event itself. There we go. And um, a method of raising it. There we go. Um, invoke. Whoops. Uh, triggers when disconnect it um, from the remote server, uh, remote host, remote server. We'll use server. There we go. Um, this could either be the client disconnecting from the server or the server disconnecting the client. There we go. All right. Now uh, it would also be nice to know whether um, authentication was successful or failed. Uh, so let's put in um, events for that. Authentication um, success, maybe, or nah. We will name this authenticated. There we go. And another delegate void. 
event handler. We don't really need any kind of uh, data from it um, because it's just a hey, did this succeed? Yes or no? Um, there, event hand typo. <laughs> And again, method for raising it, um, invoke, there we go, add in some documentation, triggers upon successful authentication. Um, we can throw in an authentication failed. And for now, we don't really know whether um, uh, event handler, we actually need to pass a message along. Um, basically, if the authentication fails, then um, it's typically because the password is wrong. So my guess would be that uh, we don't exactly get any kind of um, uh, descriptive uh, failure message uh, from the remote host. So let's just, I know assumption is the mother of all screw-ups, but for the moment let's just assume that we don't. Uh, if we do get a message from the server, um, we'll, we can either update the event uh, to pass the message along, or we can simply just ignore it. Uh, we know that the authentication failed. Why it failed doesn't really matter as such. Um, Uh, because uh, for the most part it will be f because of an incorrect password. So, um, grab this, protect it on, there we go, so we can raise it. Boom. Triggers if the attempt at authenticating failed. This is most likely due to incorrect password. There we go. <coughs> now the final event that um, we need to um, add in here uh, deals with um, some kind of command response, uh, which would be this case. Um, this tells us that the incoming payload, meaning whatever is in the packet that the server sent, uh, is the output of the command that was executed. Meaning if the command on the server that we're connected to actually has some kind of output, uh, then we get a packet back containing that output. Um, so we should probably add in um, some kind of server response event. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, server response. Might as well. There we go. Uh, event handler. Now we also know that uh, there may be uh, some kind of message coming back from the server. So um, We'll pass that as the response message and grab the whoops typos. I'm full of them today. <laughs> event handler. There we go. Now we've declared the event and we'll add in um, a method of actually. Uh, racing the event. There we go. And do the response message. Triggers when our response is received from the remote server. There we go. Now we have the means to actually um, report back what the server res responded with, if anything. Now, um, as it's listed right here, there is no way of detecting unknown commands. Um, 
which uh, in my test uh, holds true. Sometimes um, a Minecraft server will respond with um, unknown command or some um, other similar message and sometimes it just responds with nothing. Um, some commands don't have any kind of text output. Um, uh, for example, um, um, opping a player on the server to become server operator uh, doesn't produce any kind of text response through Archon. Uh, Deopping uh, a player uh, doesn't uh, produce any kind of response except an empty string. So uh, there are situations where we have to assume that this particular command um, uh, got executed as expected. Um, it's just one of those things. In any way, um, this effectively also tells us that um, uh, though many commands return nothing, um, blah 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 blah, this b tells us that we could end up in a situation where response message is empty. But since we can raise the event, then at least we know that the server, um, to some extent, um, accepted the command and sent back uh, at least a handshake telling us, yes, I received the command and I executed it. So, um, there we go. Okay. Uh, we now have a bunch of events defined. Um, good having those. Um, I doubt we will need much more of them right now, so I'll collapse the uh, code for them since we don't really need to work with them right now. Um, we do want one thing added in though. Um, it would be nice if we have a, have a method that um, we can call uh, passing the command we want to execute uh, and then that effectively sends the command to the server without us having to know exactly how this uh, network stuff uh, has to be handled. Um, so uh, in the spirit of fire and forget um, and uh, kiss, keep it stupid simple, uh, we'll just make another public method called execute. And yes, we can easily have a method called execute. Public and then the command to execute. There we go. Um, while connected to a remote server, attempts to execute the past command. The text command to execute in the remote server's console. There we go. Now, um, by having this, um, we can then do something along these lines. Um, actually, we had one here. Um, source remote new. Ah, derp, 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 derp. <laughs> this now leaves us uh, very few um, actual methods um, and events. Uh, so it should make it a little bit easier to use it once we're done with it, of course. Um, and this would effectively allow us to do something like um, if archon is connected, then archon.execute, um, let's just for the sake of argument do a list command. That's it. Uh, this definitely makes it a heck of a lot easier to uh, communicate with the remote server. Uh, we can then also um, hook the uh, different events um, and then use the events to figure out exactly what the re server respo responded with. Um, moving on. Okay. Um, Next up, uh, we should probably look into um, building up the actual um, uh, main th uh, thread that will host this network connection. So, 
let's um, have a look at that. Uh, keep in mind that we have the send queue up here. Um, we will add in a um, method here, um, private method, send to host. Um, we will overload this uh, because we know that we need to do some uh, text converting. Uh, so uh, just to make it easier on ourselves, uh, we'll do an overloaded version of it. Um, void send to host. Um, this is definitely something that we need to do uh, because we um, need to queue up whatever data we need to send um, to uh, the remote host. Um, and for this uh, instance of send to host, we will start off by having um, it accept an actual packet. Um, the protocol uh, for using remote console uh, specifies that we have to use a specific format, uh, which they call a packet. So um, we probably also need to build up some kind of packet handling for us, um, just to make it easier on ourselves. So uh, we will do that as well. Now, in this case, um, or this overloaded version of it, um, host uh, string command to send. Um, um, uh, queues up the past packet to be sent to the remote host. Uh, the archon packet to queue up for sending. There we go. And here, um, let's see, uh, sends the past command as an archon packet to the remote server. Uh, actually, um, let's call this uh, send to server instead. Um, I keep using both uh, terminologies. They are basically the same, but um, let's try and keep some consistency here. Um, there and there. There we go. All right. Um, now at least we have them declared. Um, we'll do the typical uh, implement um, text to write conversion and um, uh, put into a packet, an archon packet um, here to do. Um, add the past packet to the current send queue. Okay. Um, so far, so good. Now, let's have a look at all the packet stuff. Um, since we are now at the point of um, having to deal with them, uh, we might as well see if we can implement something that can manage those packets for us. So let's go ahead and make a region for packet handling. Now, if we go back and have a look at um, the documentation, um, we know that um, any packet being sent either from the client to the server or from the server to the client effectively follows this exact structure. Um, the initial four bytes of it, uh, given that it's a 32-bit int, um, will contain the length or the size of the remainder of the packet, um, meaning it will always be four bytes less than um, uh, the, the full uh, size of the packet. Um, here it says request ID. 
um, and it also clearly states client generated ID. Um, what that ID is um, doesn't really matter as long as we use it to check and verify that the packets we receive from the server have the same ID that we used to send uh, a request to the server. Um, this effectively verifies that uh, server and client are still in sync. Um, we can do this uh, sequentially, uh, meaning we start with a message number of say 1, uh, the next will be 2, the next will be 3 and so on, uh, or we can do some kind of randomized numbering. Um, it doesn't really matter what, uh, what we do here as long as we keep track of what the last um, generated ID was. Um, so let's, now that we've got this in mind, uh, let's go do something to handle that. Um, for the sake of this, um, since it doesn't really matter all that much what the ID actually is, uh, we might as well just do uh, a random number. So, um, we know that um, we need a random number generator, so let's do a random RNG equals null to begin with. Um, we will uh, initialize this with um, a randomized seed um, whenever this class is instantiated, um, and then we just need to do a um, either a method or a, a local uh, property to um, uh, handle fetching the ne next ID number. Um, for this we'll just do um, generate packet ID, uh, do it as a method. Um, the rest of this is actually pretty simple. Uh, we will simply return the rng dot uh, next, which as you can see returns an integer. We will also specify that um, we will have a minimum value of say 100 and a maximum value of whatever an int can hold. Uh, so let's see what an int can hold. Um, it has a max value representing uh, 2 billion blah blah blah. Um, and just for the sake of making sure that we are within range, uh, we'll subtract our minimum value. There we go. This now generates a number between 100 and uh, 2 billion, 147 billion, blah blah blah. Alright, um, this we actually just need to do private. Um, we don't exactly need to expose that but for the sake of um, informing ourselves, uh, generates a randomized uh, packet ID number. And pretty much the same, returns a randomized positive uh, int total um, packet ID number. Uh, this will always generate um, a positive random number, but before we can get this working we actually need to uh, set up the um, random num number generator. So let's jump down to the constructor and set the random number generator to uh, random. Um, and here it allows us to specify a seed. Now, the, the easiest way to uh, generate a non-recurring uh, seed is simply to grab uh, the current date time. Now specifies this exact moment. And then just to ensure that we get a proper um, seed number, we will use the millisecond property, which uh, returns the milliseconds component of the date represented by this instance, um, which means uh, a uh, millisecond count of uh, the moment right now. Uh, this uh, effectively ensures that the 
random gen number generator uh, is never given the exact same seed number. Very quick and easy way of doing it. All right, let's go back up here. Um, right here. All right, this one is now set up. Uh, the next thing that we should probably do is to have a private int last packet ID. And we will start by setting that to zero. Now, we'll, um, last packet ID will always contain the last used uh, packet ID number. We can use this to uh, confirm that the packet we received from the server uh, is, uh, or, sorry, it matches um, the one that we previously sent. Uh, so even though <coughs> the server might respond with an empty response, we can still use the packet ID to confirm that the server actually responds to the message we just sent to it comes in very handy. All right. Um, next up, uh, let's see about, um, actually, let's put um, this in here, private method, generate packet ID. Stuff that in here, then we can collapse that and get rid of it. There we go. All right, we also need to do some packet conversion. Um, and for that, um, we can do things like, we'll, we'll just name it packet for now. We'll see if it ends up conflicting somehow. Um, private um, byte. Um, Nah, actually, let's uh, name this uh, convert packet. There we go. Okay, convert packets. Um, uh, we know that we need to uh, put in some kind of um, a command to send or uh, some kind of uh, password or whatever. Uh, so for the sake of um, naming, let's just call this payload, since that's basically what it is. Um, the one thing that we need to keep track of um, is, of course, the um, uh, packet that we need to send. Um, uh, let's see here, uh, grab this one. Um, we need to figure out the size. Um, we need to send an ID. We need to specify a type. Um, the uh, body or payload uh, that we want to send and finish off with an empty string. So let's have a look at the packet types. Uh, right here it specifies that um, the packet type field is a 32-bit little endian in integer. Um, little endian, big endian um, basically just uh, specifies um, which of the bytes uh, contains the most significant byte and um, which uh, contains th the least significant portion of uh, the actual integer value. Um, We'll uh, use a method uh, of the bit converter to um, help us figure out whether we need to reverse it or not. Um, just a, a tiny trick. Um, in any case, um, we need to specify, or, or we need to be able to um, uh, both communicate and uh, also read uh, these four different types. Um, so why don't we go in and um, specify those right away. We'll do this as a constant. Uh, we know that it needs to be an integer. And then we will grab server auth. 
equals uh, three. Um, we need another one, which would be server auth response, uh, which is specified as two. Um, we need a server data execute uh, command. That was one of my chinchillas in the background. Uh, there we go. Um, and this one, interestingly enough, also has a value of two. And then a server data response value. There we go with a value of zero. Okay, there is actually one more um, uh, indication uh, that we can check up against, um, which is not listed here. Uh, it is mentioned though, um, let's see where it was mentioned. It is mentioned right here. Now this is not strictly speaking a uh, packet type, um, however, uh, we do know that the ID um, of a server data auth response can contain a value of negative one. So um, instead of us having to remember that um, a uh, server auth failure uh, is negative one, um, we'll just add in a constant here for that as well. That way we don't need to remember what the actual value is. Uh, we can just reference it as a um, descriptive name. So server data all fail um, negative one. Now we can check up against this instead of uh, having to um, put in a negative one everywhere we need to check it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's see about converting this into uh, something useful. All right. Um, we know that um, it is specified in the protocol that uh, whatever payload we choose to send or receive um, must be um, ASCII encoded. Um, so we at least need to um, grab the payload and make sure that it is actually ASCII encoded. So let's start by doing that. Um, uh, packet body equals um, text. Dot, um, let's get ASCII encoding, and here we can, uh, eh, I'll just do encoding uh, ASCII and get bytes, and pass the payload, there we go. This now ensures that uh, the packet body um, is always um, ASCII encoded as much as possible. Uh, granted, if we take uh, some kind of Unicode character that doesn't convert well to ASCII, um, the uh, text encoding will most likely put a question mark in there, uh, which effectively means that uh, we could lose something in encoding. However, um, in most cases, any kind of console uh, command input uh, for game servers and such um, is usually made in English um, or some uh, similar uh, setup, sometimes in uh, uh, code references, and all of those are always um, specified as A to Z, uh, both including um, and possibly some symbols, which means for the most part this conversion should uh, always succeed. Um. All right, next up um, we need to um, 
have another look at uh, the structure of um, an actual packet. Now, the reason we need to do that is because we need to try to calculate um, the initial size of uh, the packet. Um, because that is a requirement as part of the protocol. Uh, so, um, first thing we can do is um, declare a packet size and we will set that equal to uh, the packet body length. Now for this we also need to add um, one byte um, oops, sorry, this needs to be size, there we go one byte to zero terminate the packet body as specified uh, right here we also know that we need to add one more for the um, closing empty string so let's do that packet size um, uh, one by two zero terminate the empty string at the end of the packet. Now we also know that we have to th throw in a packet ID as specified here as well as a type both of them being signed integers 32-bit uh, so um, since each 32-bit uh, uh, integer is um, a total size of 4 bytes, um, we can also easily add those. Um, 4 bytes to hold the packet ID, packet size, and another 4 bytes to hold the packet type. There we go. Alright. Now, we still need to um, grab a packet ID. We also need to um, um, uh, con uh, convert both uh, the packet ID and the packet type uh, into a byte array uh, and then stuff all of this together in one huge um, uh, byte array that contains all of it in the correct order. Um, so uh, let's start by um, first of all uh, generate a new packet ID for this. So um, packet ID equals generate uh, packet ID. Then we will um, do a packet ID bytes equals and for this we can use the bit converter uh, that get bytes uh, to convert an integer there we go uh, returns the specified 32-bit signed integer value as an array of bytes very nice let's grab that all right now this is the place where we uh, should check whether um, we need to reverse uh, the byte order uh, for the endianness um, and luckily for us the bit converter actually does have a method that det or um, um, it has a method uh, of uh, al that allows us to check uh, which endianness um, this particular computer uses um, and um, if this is not um, little endian as specified right here it has to be little endian so if it's not little endian then we will reverse the packet ID bytes There we go. And now 
to repeat the process for the packet type. Um, that's actually something that we need to specify, so let's add that in here. Packet type, there we go. It needs to be an int, uh, so um, basically the same process. Uh, packet type bytes equals bit converter dot get bytes packet type and again we need to check whether it's little Indian if it's not then we will reverse uh, the packet type bytes array there we go all right the very last thing that we need to do is effectively merge all of this into um, a single uh, array that contains all of it. Um, so let's build up a uh, result uh, which will have a size of. Um, we've already um, counted up the size needed but since we also need to uh, contain the actual size itself, um, we need to add another four bytes to uh, packet size. So we shall do packet size plus four. Sweet. Then we will again do the um, packet size bytes equals bit converter dot get bytes um, packet size and again this needs to be little Indian so we'll do another bit converter is little Indian then array dot reverse uh, the packet size bytes there we go actually we will move this down here alright um, Right here, we actually forgot to do something. Last packet ID equals the packet ID. Uh, store this I ID for later verification. If the byte order is not little endian, reverse the byte order. And this is basically the same, so we'll just grab this. There we go. All right, now we are ready to merge all of it into one array. So we can do that that by using the uh, array dot copy. In this case, we need to start off with the packet size bytes start at index 0 um, stuff it into result at index 0 and uh, this will be the length of um, uh, this indicates the number of bytes that we need to copy over all right that's the th first 32 bits taken care of here. Now we will add in the ID. Which would be the packet ID bytes. Again, start at um, index 0 in the source array and stuff it into the result array at position 4 since we already know that um, um, a 32-bit integer becomes 4 bytes, so um, let's grab this again, there we go. This takes care of the ID. Then we add in the um, packet type bytes, and this would then go 4 further, so 8, and the length of it. There we go. And then this next one um, actually imposes a little bit of a problem because uh, at the moment um, 
this does not zero terminate it. So um, for the uh, last two bytes um, we will cheat a little bit. Um, whenever you create a new um, um, byte array like we have done right here uh, this um, gives us an array containing packet size plus four entries and each entry um, is pre-initialized to be zero. So in effect um, we can assume that the last two bytes uh, in this um, uh, result array uh, will always have a value of zero but uh, for good measure we will force those to be zero just before we return it. Um, we never know. In any case, uh, let's copy over the um, packet body. Um, starting at zero into the result array starting at position 12 um, and the length of it. Now since this this will be effectively random um, it will have the length of each command being sent. Um, this will have in effect a random length um, but uh, we need to force the last two bytes in the result array to be uh, zero so um, we will simply just do this little cheat trick. Now keep in mind that arrays uh, in indexing is always zero based and uh, length is always one based any kind of sizing um, which is why the um, second last um, entry of the uh, result array um, will actually be the uh, length minus two and the last index will be the length minus one to go from one based to zero based. There we go. Then we return the um, array now containing a fully encoded uh, packet just as they've specified. Cool. Now here it would be nice if we could also um, convert this from the raw data that comes from the server back into say uh, just the payload message. That aspect would be nice uh, but at the same time we probably also want to know the ID and the type and so on and so forth. Uh, we can do individual um, uh, methods for that if we want to split those out. Um, uh, we can also do a um, method um, or a version of this uh, convert packet method that simply um, convert packet takes a byte array in the packet and outs the packet type which means uh, this method will uh, as an argument output the packet type um, it will output whoops out int uh, the packet ID as well as the um, packet message now we can choose whether we want this to be uh, just a regular uh, return or uh, we want to put it here. Um, for the time being I think we will simply just do a normal string return here and have that return the actual payload of the packet. <coughs> Alright, now we know that um, the protocol specifies that each packet uh, should always contain um, the size of the data following uh, the size itself. Uh, so let's um, start by checking that the packet actually has um, the length that we expect. Um, so uh, let's go packet size 
No, actually we'll do a um, tap it um, equals new byte uh, 4. Um, this we will use to um, copy out parts of the uh, packet. So let's start by copying out the um, size. Uh, copy from the packet starting at index 0, uh, copy it into the temp int starting at index 0 and we know it needs a length of 4 bytes. Um, then again we need to check uh, whether um, this is little Indian because if it isn't then we need to uh, reverse this. Um, Meetings. Uh, let me check quick. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yes, we do need to, to um, do that. All right. Um, there we go. Uh, since we grabbed a copy of um, the four bytes that indicate the um, uh, packet size at the moment uh, as indicated by the initial index of zero, uh, if this is not little Indian then uh, we need to reverse it. Um, we could have just specified uh, the bit conversion directly in the packet but that would prevent us from doing this. So, um, this then becomes the packet size, bit converter, uh, 2 int 32, and we will specify the temp int array. And um, um, there we go. I forgot the start index. This would now hold the actual size of uh, the packet minus 4. So to verify that this packet is actually th the length that we expect, we will check if packet.length equals packet size plus 4. Verify that the received packet is of correct size. There we go. Right. Um, <clears throat> so far, so good. We know that the size is correct. Um, and uh, the next step is then, of course, to uh, split out the packet type, the ID, and the actual payload. Um, but before we do that, I think we will do a quick uh, measure of um, house cleaning because um, we basically have all of this junk for uh, three times um, and we would have to go through the exact same thing down here so um, just for the purpose of making things a little easier for ourselves we'll do another converter um, private method convert int 32 Uh, strictly speaking, this is not needed. It um, just allows us to tidy up the code a little bit. So here we need one that converts from the actual int value to a byte array. And we also need one that uh, converts um, to the actual int value from the byte array. So we'll do this. And just for the sake of making parts of it easier for us, we will overload this last one, allowing us to specify um, a start index. Int convert byte value int start index. The reason for this is um, by having this one, we can simply just uh, pass the actual packet data 
uh, to this method, uh, specify where it should start reading the integer value, uh, and then we get the actual integer value. Um, it just saves us the whole process of uh, having to grab this copy um, and then manipulating this uh, aspect of it. Um, of course we still need to do it, but um, we can do it here instead of having to do it in the actual packet handling cell. So, uh, let's start by um, converting this uh, integer to a byte array. Um, it bytes equals um, bit converter dot get bytes grab the value if um, the bit converter is not a little endian then uh, do the reverse uh, there we go and then we return them job done Uh, converts the past uh, int 32 bits signed uh, into a forced little Indian byte array. The int 32 bit signed uh, value to convert and returns a forced little Indian uh, byte array containing the original int value. Boom. There we go. Um, if I did have some uh, comment, if the byte order is not little Indian right here, uh, reverse the byte order. There we go. Return the result. Alright, now this one effectively goes in the opposite direction. So, um, just to make it simpler on ourselves, we will simply just return the convert int 32 um, value comma zero. Um, Converts the past uh, byte array into a, uh, a 32 bit signed int value. The um, uh, blah 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 byte array value to convert uh, returns a 32 bit signed int value. There we go. Alright. Whoops. Typos are us today. The past um, byte array starting at the specified start index into a 32 bit uh, signed int value. Alright, the byte array value to convert, the position at which to start the int uh, conversion. And this one is identical to the other one, so let's grab that quick. There we go. Alright. Now, um, we could potentially specify a, a start index that would be out of bounds. Um, meaning, um, if we have a byte array that has, um, let's say, uh, nine entries and we specify to start at position eight, uh, then there are simply not enough bytes left in the array um, to complete a full 32-bit um, uh, value. So, first of all, um, to prevent our code from crashing, uh, we need to ensure that um, the remaining length uh, of the uh, byte array uh, is sufficient to actually grab a 32-bit value from this particular position. Um, so um, that is definitely something we need to um, 
do a bit of checking on. Okay, so um, if uh, the start index is less than value dot length uh, minus four, then we can do the, the conversion. Um, if this is not the case, then we will forcibly return um, a zero. All right, um, then we um, will grab a temp value of length four, copy over um, from the past value at start index to uh, the temp value at start index zero, and um, we need to copy four bytes. Then we need to um, declare a result equals zero uh, if uh, this is not um, little Indian, then we need to do the array reverse uh, to get things uh, get the byte order uh, set up correctly, um, which would be the temp value. There we go. And then um, yeah, actually we don't need to use this, we can just return a uh, bit converter um, to int 32 um, temp value at start position 0. Now this um, is strictly here for the sake of um, saving us uh, the trouble of having to write this piece of code over and over and over again. Uh, so, um, let's close this one up and go down here. Now, as you can see uh, right here, we basically have the same uh, conversion stuff uh, three times. So, um, this new convert to uh, convert int 32 method just saves us the trouble of having duplicate code. So, um, for now, Let's clean this up a little bit, shall we? Now, packet ID bytes, um, we will convert this or change this to use the new convert int 32 method. And then we can delete this. Oh yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. But unfortunately, it's a hardware issue. It's not a software issue. And the same thing here. Uh, we will make use of our nifty new method. There we go. With this um, convert int 32 method, we no longer need to remember whether we have to convert or not. We can simply call that, and it internally takes care of it. Um, and another one right here. There we go. And now we know for sure that the ID, the type, as well as the size is always uh, encoded in the correct Indianness as expected. Greetings, easy box. Um, the real nibble bits, also, yes. Uh, really cool names, by the way. Um, anyways, um, we now have a simpler method of converting back and forth between um, little and big Indianness as needed. Uh, if this project is loaded up on, I guess, uh, Mac OS um, and encoded there, um, it would be big Indian since uh, Macintosh is based on Motorola chips, um, which um, address things opposite of um, Intel and AMD, uh, hence the difference between little and big Indian. But um, since we have a conversion method that takes care of this particular issue, um, it doesn't really matter um, which Indianness um, the PC actually has. Um, well, at the moment, um, the launcher is 
pretty much the same thing as if uh, you used uh, the FTB launcher or MultiMC or uh, uh, Mojang's own launcher, except this one launches uh, an actual Minecraft server. Um, the goal of this particular project is to uh, end up having a uh, a kind of uh, launcher um, that can sit there and monitor um, the health of the server. Um, uh, I would like to have the option to schedule, uh, say, um, uh, two uh, service restarts a day, uh, or three or four, depending how many are needed. Uh, I would also like to be able to schedule, uh, say, a mid-daily maintenance shutdown, which also does a backup of uh, the Minecraft game world and user accounts and such. Um, and um, I would also like it to be able to handle uh, running more than one server. So uh, if I, for instance, want to continue running my um, private uh, modded server alongside with a uh, private vanilla server, uh, then this Minecraft launcher uh, can handle running both of those servers um, just by me starting it up and it will then ensure that these servers get restarted at least once a day. Um, Minecraft servers have a tendency to love being restarted at least once a day, especially the modded ones. <laughs> uh, so that's the overall goal for now uh, for this uh, launcher. Uh, but it strictly handles uh, the servers uh, and nothing else. Um, what we're doing right now is implementing um, the Archon protocol. Uh, which is more or less uh, copied one-to-one -one from the original Valve source remote console uh, protocol. Uh, so this class will eventually become a uh, fully wrapped uh, way of Archon communicating with a Minecraft server or uh, any of the uh, Valve source products that support the Archon protocol. All right, um, this one is the um, conversion back. Uh, so, um, since we now have a, you are a very welcome easy box. Any other questions, anyone in channel, uh, don't be shy. Please feel free to ask and comment. Um, I do have uh, my good friend Skyrider to support me. Uh, he's with me on uh, my Discord. Um, and will notify me if there's something I don't see. So um, don't hold back. Uh, no questions are stupid. There are only stupid answers. So, all right. Um, this will be the one that actually I need to document this one because I completely forgot that. All right. Um, converts the past. Um, actually generates a um, uh, blah 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 valid uh, archon uh, packet based on the specified packet type um, with the specified payload. Uh, the type of packet to generate uh, the uh, payload to uh, include. There we go. Returns a uh, valid Archon uh, protocol packet as a byte array. There we go. Nice. Now this one um, expects a packet and um, outputs the packet type, the packet ID, as well as uh, any potential uh, payload. Thank you very much for the follow easy box. Okay, so let's get the documentation down. Um, it's always good to make sure that you document your things, even your internal uh, methods that uh, uh, the rest of the code world doesn't exactly see. Um, 
And the reason for doing that is so that you can do things like this, for example. Uh, say byte packet equals convert packet. Um, there we go. Generates a valid Archon packet based on the specified packet type with the specified payload. It does help having your own documentation telling you what your methods do. So keep that in mind. All right, this one now, um, let's see. Um, uh, expects a valid Archon protocol packet. Um, splits the packet data into uh, its packet type, packet ID, and returns the pay payload, if any. All right, the Archon protocol packet to convert. Um, uh, blah, 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 the uh, type of packet uh, received, um, the ID number of this packet uh, returns the payload found in the packet, if any, um, otherwise an empty string. Look. There we go. All right. Cool. <coughs> now this junk we don't really need anymore. So let's get rid of this and simply just do packet size equals convert int 32, which accepts the um, byte array uh, of the packet itself, as well as an index um, of where to begin the conversion process. So uh, we can simply specify the packet as well as a start index of zero. And the reason for this is because the actual packet itself uh, expects to have an initial header that specifies the size of the following data. And since these packets are identical um, when sent from client to server, as well as when sent from server to client, uh, we know that the first four bytes will always indicate the size of the packet itself. And this then leads us to be able to verify that the, the actual received data um, matches the expected length of this particular packet. It's just a quick and dirty way of checking that this is correct. Um, at the moment, however, um, IntelliSense uh, is actually telling us that uh, we're doing some uh, not so nice things. The out parameter packet type must be assigned to before control leaves the current method. Uh, the out parameter packet ID, blah, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, we doesn't. We we currently don't return um, a proper value. So, just to do a case of um, resetting stuff, um, we will uh, set them right here. Packet type equals, and then we have these. So. Um, since this situation will only occur if there is some kind of failure, we will just force it to become auth failure. And we will do the same for the packet ID. Um, this effectively forces both of them to become negative one uh, and return an empty string. Um, if this verification is successful, then we can further uh, attempt to decode uh, what's in there um, and then do a final return down here before um, exiting this if statement, um, which should take care of it. All right, we know that uh, the next uh, bit of data um, it, uh, in the packet uh, will be the ID of the packet itself. Um, that ID is client generated. In our case, we simply set up a uh, randomizer to take care of that packet ID for us. 
Um, and um, right here, we can actually grab that packet ID right off the bat by using our internal convert in 32, specify the packet as well as the start position of 4. And we can do the same thing for packet type, convert int 32 packet, which would be the eighth byte to start at. All right, that takes care of ID, it takes care of type. The only thing remaining is body. And we know that um, it expects to have a zero terminated string um, in the body, uh, same as the payload as well as an empty zero terminated string uh, following that. So that effectively means that the last two bytes in the array must be zero. So uh, that's actually a thing that we can also uh, verify, uh, just to make sure that this is uh, actually a valid um, packet. So let's put that in here. If packet, whoops. I'm very good at typos today. Equals to uh, zero, and the last entry in the array also equals zero. Then we know that um, we do have the um, um, string termination correct. The only thing remaining here is to uh, grab a copy of whatever the payload might be. Um, so to calculate um, the actual size of uh, the payload itself, uh, we can simply grab packet size and subtract um, the other parts. Um, in this case, we know that um, packet size is uh, four bytes for the ID, um, four, another four bytes for the type, um, two bytes for the two zero terminations, um, and the rest of it will be the body. So, um, let's grab um, the payload length and grab the packet size minus, as I mentioned, four bytes for um, the packet ID and four bytes for the packet type, as well as the two bytes for the uh, uh, zero terminations of, this, of the string. Now, there is one more thing that um, uh, we need to do here, and that's um, check whether this payload length um, is greater than zero. Uh, for the sake of um, being able to store stuff, we will do payload and initialize this to be an empty string. Then we will do if the payload length is greater than zero, then we know that uh, we actually did get some kind of response. So um, here we will do a quick um, payload bytes equals a new byte uh, array of payload length. Then we will do a copy of um, the packet and this will then be at position size takes up four bytes, id takes up four bytes, type takes up four bytes, which means that we need to start at the twelfth um, byte position. There we go, 4812, fairly straightforward. Uh, copy it into the payload bytes at index zero and uh, grab the payload length. There we go. Now, as specified right here, um, these strings are ASCII encoded. So to get this uh, converted back, um, we will simply just do the payload equals encoding um, default and get string. 
the interesting thing about uh, using the default text encoder is that um, internally it figures out what um, encoding um, the byte array might be in and converts it to um, standard Unicode. Uh, any kind of string um, within the .NET framework uh, internally uh, is always Unicode encoded. So it's not something we need to worry about a huge deal. Um, payload bytes, there we go. And this effectively converts it into the string as expected. So the only thing left to do is to return out because we have already encoded the packet ID which is output right here. Uh, we've encoded the packet type which is uh, thrown back here and here we will just return the actual payload. There we go. Whoops. Job done. Now these uh, two convert packet methods um, are only here to make life a little bit easier for us um, in terms of handling um, sending packets back and forth. Um, since we don't exactly need to um, do all of the verification within the uh, actual uh, packet conversion stuff, um, it's something that we can do further down. Uh, this strictly deals with um, effectively uh, serializing uh, the data that needs to be sent as well as unserializing the data that comes back um, into data types that we can actually used, uh, use for something. Um, anytime you need to um, uh, network, send and receive, um, it will always take place in a byte array. Uh, so you always need to uh, do some kind of um, uh, um, byte array conversion unless you decide to use um, specific streams to do so. Um, personally, I don't always like working with streams. Uh, I do prefer um, the old style method of uh, doing things manually with byte arrays because I feel it leaves me greater control over the data that goes goes uh, in and out. Um, nobody except Microsoft knows exactly what their stream objects do internally. And um, I guess I'm a little bit paranoid when it comes to that, but uh, all of the recent uh, telemetry additions to Windows 10 and so forth are, in my opinion, a good indicator of um, how little we can actually trust Microsoft. Anyway, that's a different discussion. Um, all right, so um, in this case, um, we have the sent to server. Now, this one says, uh, add the past packet uh, to the current sent queue. All right, let's do that. Now, since we're uh, going to run this in a separate thread, um, we definitely need to um, thread lock uh, things whenever we change something that um, potentially two threads uh, will be working with. Um, so um, the way to do that is to use the keyword lock and then um, uh, specify the send queue. Um, this is the object that we will be manipulating um, between the, th the uh, thread that runs this uh, remote uh, console and the thread that handles all the network processing. Um, so it makes sense uh, thread locking to uh, the sent queue object. And since we don't really need to do any additional uh, handling here, uh, thread lock the sent queue. All we need to do is send q.nq and then the byte uh, array, in this case the packet, um, nq that, and that's pretty much job done. Now, in the networking thread, um, there will be a section of code that deals with. Um, checking the send queue if there is anything that needs to be sent. Um, 
it will then become uh, uh, be dequeued. Uh, the message will be sent. In this case, it will be a full uh, packet byte array, um, and then. Um, it will continue on to check if there is some kind of response. If there isn't, then uh, it'll see if there's another um, queued up um, data packet that needs to be sent and then send that and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's basically a queue processing uh, alongside with uh, something that checks whether um, uh, some amount of data uh, came in. Uh, this one um, <coughs> Uh, this one accepts uh, some kind of command. Um, I'm actually thinking about renaming this to payload. Um, there we go. Whoops. Yeah, payload. No, payload. There we go. Payload. Typos are us today. Um, there we go. Uh, this um, implement text to byte conversion and put into an Archon packet. Well, we actually already have something that can do that for us. Um, packet equals convert packet. Hmm, this one expects a packet type and a t uh, payload. So um, I think we will just modify this one to also have a packet type specified. That way we can just, um, if I could stop being derpy typo today, we can do this. And by doing that, we get uh, a valid packet. Um, and since uh, we effectively just need to queue it up afterwards, we might as well just throw it to the other one. There we go. Packet encoding implemented and the send queue is in implemented. Fairly straightforward. Okay, um, I have been going on and on and on for about two hours now, so um, if you will excuse me for a minute, I think I need a nature break. And I will be right back.